I didn't come home. And I knew something is wrong. As the time went on, I started to have dreams. It felt so real. In the dream, she was telling me she was being held against her will. And I'm like, where are you, where are you? She was like, I don't know. I'm in this room, it just has one window, but I don't see nothing. She was crying and she's like, I don't wanna be here, I don't wanna be here. Rockville, spelled out in rocks. I like it. Super pretty. They take a lot of pride in this being a historic district. I mean, there's signs on every lamppost. Rockville was an old mill town. A lot of, lot of silk mills, a lot of woolen mills. You have mills here and they were a booming industry. And then on top of the hill, that's where the owners would build their mansions, where they could sit back and survey the empire that they built. It doesn't look real. It looks like a movie set, like something that you would see at Disney World. It was first or second richest town in the United States at one time. Down below, you have the workers' housing. You can see here, these are little, you know, salt box kit houses that would have been really easy to put up quickly back when this community really had a lot of industry. Rockville really was the hub here. But as time progressed, certain parts of, of Rockville have fallen on hard times. Rockville became the center of a lot of problems too drug dealing and shootings and serious crime. As the town began to change, less traditional businesses made their way in. In 2007, this was a strip club called Cahoots, which was a really big draw to this community. It was a big party spot. And so people in town had pretty strong opinions about whether it was great and super fun or it was an element of the city that was creeping into a town that had fallen on hard times. There was a young woman named Shemaya Smith who was in her early 20s who would commute from East Hartford all the way out here to dance because it was a lucrative opportunity for her. One day, she leaves for work, but she never makes it home. What could have happened is she deciding she doesn't want to be a part of this business anymore? Is she kidnapped? Or is it something worse than that? And for her family, the not knowing was excruciating. My name is Monique Frank. I'm the sister of Shemaya Smith. I have four siblings. I'm the oldest out of everyone. Shemaya was the youngest. She always had a smile on her face. Somewhat naive, no one did any wrong in her eyes. Just because of the difference in age, I felt like Shemaya was my daughter. That was my baby. My kids, they love Auntie Maya, that's what they call her. They just always wanted to be with her because she was just so fun. Take them to the park, let's go ride bikes, let's go live on edge a little bit because your mom not gonna let you do this, so, so you know. Well, I lived in my own apartment, Shemaya lived with my mom and her dad. She wanted to go back to school to do cosmetology. But in 2007, she was dancing as a, a exotic dancer. I didn't approve of some of the things that she would do, so she would kind of like hide it from me. I got the phone call from my mom saying that she might not answer her phone. I'm like, that's not like her. They said she went to work and didn't come home. And I started to call her phone 
on my way to my mom's house, but she never picked up the phone. No one is getting a response. We're reaching out to friends, um, places where we think that she would be, but no one's seen her. So I called the police. They did tell me because she was an adult, we had to wait 48 hours before they can actually take any action. It was a long 48 hours, but we waited. And then the next day, I called them back and we did the missing persons report. It was basically a waiting game after that. I think missing person cases in all police department deserve a great deal of attention. But most police departments don't pursue them vigorously enough. I was a police officer in the town of East Hartford for 30 years. Much of that time was spent as a detective, a detective sergeant, and then finally a lieutenant in charge of detectives. I always had my hand in all the cases. After the weekend, my routine was to read every report that flowed through the department. That Monday, I found a particular case, a missing person, for Shamaya Smith, 22 years old, who went missing on the 14th of March. So I go, why am I learning of this now? It's cold. It's getting cold. Candidly, I was upset that I hadn't been contacted about this case over the weekend. And when I went to the patrol supervisor, my counterpart, he said the case was just a random missing person case and the person would turn up and why would I think that there was anything more to it? But I knew right away it required immediate attention. I needed to find my sister. So I put my kids in the car. We drove to Channel 3 News and I went and gave them a picture because I wanted if someone else seen her that don't know her, maybe they could have said, hey, we've seen her here, we've seen her there. But they was like, you know, we can't we can't just air it out like that if, if there's no police report. And I'm like, there is a police report. But I guess the police didn't say anything as of yet. It was very frustrating. I felt, oh, because she's an exotic dancer, she's black, she doesn't matter. They cover what they want to cover. The number of black women who go missing in our country is disproportionately higher than the number of white women who go missing. And yet their cases are less likely to be solved. But in Shamaya's case, the lead investigator really did take this case seriously. Hi, Hello. Lieutenant Stolt. Thank you for meeting with me. Glad to meet you. This is the missing persons report. So the report was filed two days after she went missing. Yes. So I immediately took over the case as a serious crime. I don't recall exactly what raised my red flags, but I was very certain that we needed to get to it rapidly, that we didn't have any time to waste. If a person is missing, the chances are there's going to be a criminal aspect to it. Were they running from somebody? Were they being victimized? There's so many possibilities. Yeah. When we got this case, it was almost six days later. In 2007, I was an investigator. I was very new. Lieutenant Stoll kind of showed me the ropes, if you will. First place we're going to look at is the home. Anyone that has contact with that person. So Shamaya lived at home with her mother, Gloria, her father, Barry, and her boyfriend, Jamel. Everyone was a suspect at the time. They interviewed me. They interviewed my mom, they interviewed her dad, they interviewed my brothers. They asked a lot of questions about the boyfriend, how long they were together, how was the relationship, was he here when she left. Tell me about the boyfriend. When we went to the family home, Jamel was upstairs in the bedroom and he didn't come down to talk to the police or add his contribution to how he could help us. He wasn't concerned? His behaviors of not showing interest in finding her would suggest he's involved. So that's a massive red flag. Yes. 
Shemaya goes missing. And the boyfriend, Jamel, is not communicating. Was her family alarmed by his behavior? Yes, they did feel it was odd, and they pointed the finger towards him that he was involved. He's living in their home, and they are suspicious of him. The police are suspicious of him. Well, he doesn't stay there much longer. He disappears. Uh, he leaves the home. And is gone? Yes. We were notified by the family that Jamel packed up everything and he left. And we were clearly concerned, and it's very suspicious, obviously. We did track him down and finally had the opportunity to interview him. He said she was supposed to be picked up and brought to work. And so at 3 o'clock, she walked down the street, and Jamel never saw who was picking her up. So he's the last person that saw her? Yes. Is there anyone who can confirm Jamel's story that she was picked up for work that afternoon? Yes. Do you mind if I refer to this Absolutely. map? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, please. She didn't have a car, and she didn't have a driver's license, so she was dependent on people to give her rides to and from work. She lived in East Hartford, and this is the location of the Cahoots in Rockville. Okay. There was a co-worker of Shemaya's who was apparently a very close friend and she said Shemaya was getting rides from a person known as Silver Dollar. Had you ever heard that name before? No, it's a whole new person. One of the strippers at the club had told the family that Shemaya told her that Silver Dollar was going to give her a ride to work. So her friend said she got a ride from the Silver Dollar guy. Were you able to track him down? We were able to identify Silver Dollar and take a statement from him. So Silver Dollar said, yes, I came to East Hartford and I picked her up on the 14th. That day? That day that she went missing. And I took her to Cahoots. So now he becomes the last person to actually be with her. The officers came out here to verify that. And we looked at hours upon hours upon hours of video captured from their security cameras. And... We witnessed a lot of illicit activity, mm -hmm. but we could not find any video of her coming into cahoots in that time frame. So, so his story falls apart because the video evidence shows that she never arrived at work. Yes. First impulse would be that he's lying and he took her somewhere else, but it's almost too easy. What do you mean? Because it was a red herring. We looked on the day prior to being missing, and we did find that she had been dropped off at work 24 hours earlier by Silver Dollar. His dates were off. He ended up actually giving her a ride the night before, so prior to when she went missing. So now you've had Silver Dollar fall apart as a suspect. There's nothing concrete tying the boyfriend to her disappearance. What is the next piece of the puzzle for you guys to decide to pursue? Her own phone records, but you needed to get a search warrant. And getting a search warrant in this case was very difficult because there are many people who didn't believe that she was a victim of a crime. There were many people who believed that there was no need for urgency. So the administration and other agencies pushed back. It's a missing girl. That's got to be really tough because you're the person that's been in the room with the family. They didn't have any leads. They didn't know where to look. So I got wary. Basically took it into my own hands and stayed in the room and trying to, you know, break into her voicemail. I was just playing with different numbers on the house phone. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I was just playing one, two, three, four, three, four, five, six. I wasn't going to let it go. I needed to find my sister. If it had been a 22-year-old white girl, would there have been more urgency? Not on my part, but yes, it would, it would have been treated differently, absolutely. Thank God the family, they were pretty pushy about finding out what happened to Shemaya themselves. I spent two days trying to break into the code for her voicemail until I got into her voicemail. And there was this one message that stood out to me. And it was actually the day she went missing. Hey, Maya, get me back in town. 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 Get me
The person on the phone said, just wanted to know if you want to hook up. The family was able to access Shamaya's voicemail, and there was a message on there from a guy named Ken. So we ran a check on the phone number, and it came back to Ken Otto. What do you learn about him immediately just from his phone number? We learned that he lives in Ellington, Connecticut, next to Rockville, a nice quiet neighborhood full of larger, expensive houses. He's a true businessman. He built a company himself, and there were satellite offices, so he's well-to-do. He's married, has children. He's not the person that you think might hang out at strip clubs and calling exotic dancers on his phone. So because of who he was in this small town, when his name comes up on your radar, is there any pushback within the department about investigating him? It did create a whole different attitude and treatment. Now, for some reason, we have to be very careful. We have to make sure we're not offending anyone or ruffling feathers. You felt like you had to investigate quietly so as to not embarrass anybody. Uh, I didn't see it the same way at all. This is urgent. I had concern that she was maybe being held somewhere, that we might be able to locate her and bring her to safety. Mm -hmm. So we need to go find Ken Otto and talk to him and see what he can offer us regarding Shamaya. We decided we were going to take a ride up to Ellington and go see if we can talk to Mr. Otto. So we drive up to the house and Mr. Otto opens the door. His hair is kind of disheveled. He said that he had been in bed for a few days and he was feeling sick. And we explained that we wanted to talk to him in regard to a missing person case. He certainly didn't want us to park our vehicle in front of his house. He didn't want us going into his home. But he agreed to meet at the police department. What does Ken Otto tell you about his relationship with Shemaya? Ken told the investigators that he was a person who wanted to help other people. And he went to cahoots because there were women who needed his intervention, you know, a nice girl like you doing in a place like this hmm. kind of thing. He said that he knew Shamaya and she was a nice girl and that they were building their relationship. March 9th, a week prior to her disappearance, I received a call from Shamaya asking me to meet her. She pulled up in a cab and I asked her, why are you getting out the cab? Where are you coming from? And she said, oh, one of my friends dropped me off at a 7-Eleven somewhere. And I'm like, why wouldn't a person bring you all the way home? That just didn't sound right to me. She said she was coming from a friend's house, and the person gave her money, $500 or whatever. And I'm like, what did you have to do for the $500? I didn't have to do nothing. She got very defensive. Mr. Otto did admit that about a week before she went missing on the night that they drove to Esnanta College in Enfield. And she mentioned to him that she wanted to get a degree in cosmetology. He did mention that he gave her money, that she was also looking to try to purchase a car to be more independent. The pieces line up that this is the game. This is, you know, I'll put you through school. You'll do what I need from you. But he presented it that this was non-sexual, that he cared about her and he was offering what he could as a successful businessman living in Ellington. Mm -hmm. And that this is what it was all about. In the meeting with your investigators, does he admit that he saw her on March 14th? Yes, he does. He said that he ended up driving her to Coots to go to work. He told us that he wasn't feeling well and he, was, he had been sick. So he dropped Shemaya off at the Cahoots near the front door and he went home to Ellington and he was in bed for three days. Well, at this point, you'd already checked all the security footage of the Cahoots. So did it make you doubt your initial look at that footage? You want to be cold and professional and always double check. And so we did. And we rechecked and looked at the volumes of video they had. We could not find 
Kenaro's truck, mm -hmm. arriving at Cahoots, and couldn't find Shemaya coming through the door. We can't corroborate his story of dropping off at Cahoots, but what we do know is that Ken Otto is now the last person who admittedly is with her. We realized Ken Otto is hiding things, so now we have to find what he's hiding. So investigator Olson and I are arranged to meet Ken Otto and take him for a ride so he could walk us through step by step everywhere he went with Shemaya. This is Ellington, Connecticut, a thriving farming community. Ellington has the space and clearly a lot of affluence. This is the main street. It's a church, the historic society, and a strip of shops that looks like a hitching post from old timey days. It's got that safe Americana vibe to it. Crime doesn't typically happen in Ellington. It's kind of a rural community of faith-based people. Ellington was just where you lived, but the action was in Rockville, no question. It was all about Rockville. It's not lost on me that the thing to do over in Rockville back in 2007 was go to the strip club, and over here in Ellington, they proudly display the classic car shows and the ice cream social. It is a really big difference between the two communities. During the initial interview with Mr. Otto, although he was forthcoming with information, we determined that there were some things that he told us that weren't completely accurate. So Don Olson and I picked Ken Otto up and began the process retracing the steps that he claimed happened. It's important to be specific. So instead of going directly to Cahoots, uh -huh. it turns out the story is now unraveling that they traveled into Route 5. And it was clear the details of his movements. They were evolving. We continued northbound into Enfield, and Enfield is where the Asnunta Community College is. Ultimately, he claimed that they went around the side of the building and parked, and that Shemaya then uh, tried to perform sexual activities with him. That's a major piece of information that he admits, okay, I did have sexual relations with her. Now, he was starting to get antsy, and he did offer what I would call a bribe, or an attempt to bribe. He basically said something to the effect of, well, what do I need to do to make this go away? And we were kind of looking at each other like, I, don't, I think he's trying to bribe us. You know, like he was looking to see if we would say, you know, well, hey, you have to give us $10,000, we'll just forget this ever happened. Is he just embarrassed? You know, a man of his stature being caught having an affair with a much younger woman who he met in a strip club? Or is he now trying to use his means and his influence to get out from underneath an investigation into her disappearance? Guys have affairs, women have affairs. It happens in life. But there was nothing illegal about that. Whether his wife was happy with it or not, I don't know, we'll leave to others been practicing law in Connecticut for approximately 50 years. And Mr. Otto was a family man. He'd been married for 33 years. He had no criminal record. He's not the type of person that you would think would go out and commit this type of horrific crime. Ellington is a close-knit community. And he was well-respected in his own neighborhood. These are people that saw him every day. But I don't think it was common knowledge this gentleman of, uh, I believe, 54 years of age was having a relationship of any sort with this young woman of 22 years of age. As the days went by, my brothers and my mom still had hope, but this was around the time where they had a lot of trafficking. So I had this weird dream. She was being trafficked. And there was this one window 
that she was looking out of. I kept saying, tell me what you see, tell me what you see. And she kept saying, I can't see nothing. And I'm like, do you know where you're at? How long was the drive? She just kept saying, I have to keep having sex with all these guys. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. I thought that that was a sign. We don't know where she is. But you didn't have any real evidence against Ken Otto, right? Right, but I had done a little research and found out that Ken Otto mm -hmm. had a daughter-in-law. And so I contacted her. She was very emotional and upset. She spoke about Ken Otto's behavior, particularly towards women, inappropriate, dismissive, and abusive. So clearly she was afraid of something. She was anxious to hang up, mm -hmm. but she offered some information. Ken Otto owned a large tract of property, 75 acres. 75 acres is a big chunk of property. Yes, it is. It's a remote area, landlocked, surrounded by other private property and a state forest. Uh -huh. And that property was never brought up by him. So that was telling that he was hiding something from us. This is now something that we needed to get resources out there as quickly as possible. How do you even lay eyes on it if it's landlocked like that? I had called the Eastern District Major Crimes on several occasions trying to get their involvement in the case because it was in their jurisdiction, but they didn't think there was a case. That must uh, have been incredibly frustrating. It was, it was very frustrating, but I did get the cooperation of the aviation unit. I was able to get the state police helicopter up with Detective Olson. And they flew right out, of, out to the property. And then my wife, who's a detective, and her partner, they went out on the ground. It had snowed a few days before. We could see that there were tire marks leading into the property from the main road. So we could see there was recent activity. And then there was a shed, and there was a large camper. At that point, my biggest concern was Shemaya could be held against her will on that property. But you don't have a warrant to search it. No, but when you have reason to believe someone's life is maybe hanging by a thread, you have exigent circumstances. Exigent circumstances means? Emergency. So I made the decision and directed the officers on the ground get into that property right away and try to find her. Okay, sir, we're going in. My partner and I are we're in the helicopter, and we're flying over this property. And we have a couple of detectives down on the ground. I directed that the ground officers go onto the property and check those buildings out and look to see if we could find Shemaya. The detectives on foot, they went through the camper. Uh, they checked the sheds, did a quick you know, walk around the property, didn't see anything. They called back and said, there's no sign of her here. Wow. How much hope did you have that she would be in that trailer? It's a heartbreaker. I'm going to meet with Monique, who is Shemaya's older sister. And unless you have been through what their family has endured, it's impossible to imagine. She's a beautiful girl. Thank you. Hey man, hands on hips. <laughs> She's an assertive girl. Them poses. Yeah. Had Maya disappeared before? Was that something that she'd ever done? No, that's not nothing she's ever done before. I was freaking out because I'm like, something's not right. My sister is somewhere being held against her will. Yeah. It's just, it's a lot of weird people out there. Whoever has her has her ID that has her address on it, her house key. Did that make you feel unsafe that someone could just easily get your family's personal information? I was worried about that. Did the police provide other information? They told us that they went to go have a conversation with someone that's a prime suspect, the last person, to have seen her. They just said they have some leads. Back in 07, biggest thing at that point was phone records. Phone tower, location information. We found out that on the 9th, about a week before 
Uh, she went missing. Shemaya's phone hit a phone tower across the street from Otto's property. So his story about them going to Azananta College was inaccurate. And then on the 14th, the day of her going missing, Mr. Otto's phone hit in the tower across the street from his property. So that showed that he wasn't home in Ellington, sick. He was actually on the property that night. We're just about three and a half weeks in. We have quite a bit of information, and Mr. Otto is our prime suspect. We just didn't have enough to get a search warrant for the property at that point. Kurt and I both agreed that consent search was obviously going to be the way to go. Based upon phone records, they decided that they wanted to search his property up there in Stafford. My client's public position was that he had done nothing wrong, he had nothing to hide, and he fully cooperated with the police. Mr. Otto agrees to the consent search on Easter Sunday. I contacted the state police and I asked them if they were willing to supply troopers with cadaver sniffing dogs to go out to the property. So then Don Olson and I, we picked up Ken and continued to the property. We didn't let on that we'd already gotten familiar with the property. He's very cocky and very confident. I was certain he thought he was smarter than the police. And he was certain that he would control the situation completely. This is the roadway to get into the property. You know, it's a dirt road. It goes into the woods in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, it's been a while. I had a very bad feeling. Ken Otto pointed out that he liked shooting animals on his property. Woodchucks, skunks, just killing things and leaving them out to decompose. The property suggested that this is a place of terror. I told you at the time, I said, Don, I don't do this, but today I'm carrying a backup weapon and uh, we need to be on our toes with this guy because I have a bad feeling about what he might try to do to us. Right. So we started kind of looking around a little bit and asking him some questions and he didn't appear nervous at all. As we were talking, state troopers showed up with the cadaver sniffing dogs. And that is the point where Ken showed alarm in his face. That's when he really knew that he was dealing with more than just a couple of cops from the East Hartford Police Department. He had to know it was much larger than that. And it, That's right. And it was, certainly. Yeah. As soon as Mr. Otto saw the dogs, I just saw all the color come out of his face. He went pale and started to look very, very nervous. He never saw that coming. He said, you guys, this isn't fair. You tricked me. I said to him, you can revoke your consent at any time. The dogs started to go around the property, and there was a clearing. And in the clearing, there was a, a very large fire pit. The dogs are hitting on the fire pit, and they're also hitting on the piles of dirt around the clearing. Dogs can't indicate whether it's a human or fox or, or a rabbit. But they indicated there were a lot of spots where things had been killed. Mr. Otto was on his phone, and he didn't look very good. He was shaking, and he said, uh, all right, that's it. I want you guys off my property. One of the things that is so valuable about small towns and rural areas is that you live with space. There's a lot of freedom in that. The flip side of that is that there's also a lot of space to hide things. Ken Otto's property, it was what I characterized as hell. Someone's little personal hell that they created where they didn't answer to anybody and they didn't care about anything. But the fact that the dogs sensed that there was a lot of death here, we now have the ingredients to get that search warrant. But I was very anxious 
that he might do everything he can to cover his tracks. Did you know that this search was going to take place? I do remember them saying that they had to get a warrant. And then we had this big rainstorm. It rained for like five days. The day we executed the search warrant, it was raining. It was cold, nasty, rainy, windy. We got out there to the property and found Ken Otto there. He had taken the backhoe and smashed his trailer home. And he tried to bury it in the ground. So we caused him to cease and desist, and then conducted our search warrant. When we got to the fire pit, now there had been more extensive burning. And they found some, what appeared to be the ball portion of, of a foot. I received a phone call saying that I needed to come home from work because the detectives was meeting with the family at the house. The detectives came in. Um, we're sorry. Shamai is not coming home. She's deceased. And everybody just broke down. And I was like, I want to see my sister. And he was like, you don't want to remember your sister like that. That broke us, the way they found her. We didn't have a body. We didn't have anything. We just had pieces. They said she was burned for days. For days. We had been following Mr. Otto 24-7. The day of the arrest warrant, I'm sitting in the judge's chambers watching the judge read the report, and I have my partner talking to me in my ear with the team that's following Mr. Otto. They were giving us updates as the judge is sitting there reading this lengthy warrant. He's driving random places, doing quick turns, running lights, all these things that are designed to fared out the police are following him. They're telling us he's heading towards the airport. He's pulling into Bradley Airport. At that point, I directed the officer to take him into custody. Kenneth Otto Sr. may not walk the streets anytime soon. Otto was arrested at Bradley Airport with cash, pills, and a newly purchased passport. He's picked up at the airport with his passport and a large sum of money, but he's also found with rubber gloves, condoms, erectile dysfunction medication, a business card for an escort service. And then investigators find some other items in his bag, which seem even more suspicious. We found a small black satchel. Inside what we found, three or four necklaces, a pair of earrings. All of the jewelry in there was old, like beat up, maybe some sort of souvenir, as if this wasn't the first time that he's done something like this. That was something that we considered at that point. I don't think he was a newbie at this. I personally think he'd actually gotten away with other serious crimes in his lifetime. Dozens of people related to exotic dancer Shamaya Smith caught a glimpse of the man accused of her murder. Man, he shouldn't be able to get out nothing. I don't care what it is. He shouldn't be able to walk the street. I went up to the family home, and one of Shemaya's brothers, a young man, probably 14, 15 years old, who typically had kind of expressed distrust and, and anger towards the police, I remember that the brother hugged me. He just told us, thank you for doing this. Thank you for arresting the man that killed my sister. It was a tearjerker, and, but it was... The good feeling I got is, is, you know, we did right by this family. Relatives admit this is a tough time. They keep Shemaya close by wearing t-shirts with her photo on it. How quickly do you go from searching for her to fighting for justice? The same day. I mean, now the news was there. 
Uh, Mr. Otto is going to be going to court pleading not guilty and asking for a jury trial on this. He denies that he was involved with the uh, homicide of this young lady. He felt he would be acquitted merely because they find a body on the property. His claim is he wasn't the only person that had access uh, to that property, and uh, so whatever happened, it wasn't him. To see him coming in that courtroom and he had a smirk on his face as if, I'm this big shot, I got all this money, and then he got these big shot lawyers. You know, you thinking he's gonna get away with it. What was the difference in the way the media covered your sister's disappearance versus the way they covered the trial? Her disappearance was basically one clip for maybe two days, that's it. Then, once you get into, oh, exotic dancer, cahoots, murdered, slain. Shamea Smith was reported missing more than a month ago when the East Hartford woman failed to show up for her job at Cahoots in Vernon, a strip club where the 22-year-old worked as an exotic dancer. It was a lot of attention after that, rather than if we could have got to her sooner, maybe she would have been alive, you know? I'm pretty sure he's done this before. Maybe it is some people out there that don't have family to fend for them or look for them or they don't know how. And in this case, I feel like he probably thought that Shemaya didn't have any family that cared. That's why he got caught, because we did care. and farms. It's the postcard of an America that we've all heard about. That seems impossible to think anything bad could happen down there. Because it's too pretty, right? But that's not the reality for a large portion of America. And in Shemaya's case, it was somebody from one of the brightest, shiniest households that did this to her. Predators know they can target people in marginalized communities, and their cases will not be investigated and pursued as vigorously. The only way to change that is if we collectively say, no more. The solving of their cases is important to us. That's how we let predators know you don't get to work in the dark anymore. We're watching. As you can see, there's like woods everywhere. You just can't help but have your eye drawn into the woods. I remember thinking, she's out there somewhere. How deep would you go into these woods? Well, it was never ending. You just kept going, because you have a job to do. What is going through your head when you're walking through these woods? That today is the day I'm going to find my daughter. Every time I came out here, I would talk to God and say, please let me find her, let me find something. What a cute shop. I don't know how I fit this in my bag to take home, but I know a four-year-old little girl at home that would be real into this guy. We are in Snow Hill, Maryland, which is a really small town. It's only like 2,000 people. It was founded in the late 1600s. So Snow Hill predates America. It's a thriving community. There's mom and pop shops everywhere, and people are really, really proud to come from here. We're in Snow Hill, Maryland, the cutest little, little town on the Eastern Shore. I mean, it's so little, you cannot leave the house without running into somebody or five that you know. We have a great community. We go way back, a lot of history here. I was from here, my father's from here, his father was from here. 
you all work together, you go to church together. It, it's just, you feel very safe. <laughs> like I don't, per se, lock my doors. So when a young woman showed up missing, it scared me because that's not what this neighborhood is. In 2007, a young mother from Delaware, Christine Shetty, came down to this area and then she went missing. She completely vanished and no one knew what happened to her. Christine had a really good sense of humor. She was outgoing. She was just adventurous. And when Christine became a mom, she wanted to be the best mom she could ever be. She became everything to her kids that I wish I could have been to her. I'm Lynn Dodenhoff, and I am Christine Shetty's mother. When Christine was little, I sure wasn't doing a great job. My drinking was getting in the way. And I was in a couple of abusive relationships, and, and she saw a lot of, you know, the bad in me. You know, that, that bothers me a lot. Christine came from young parents. Both of our parents were alcoholics. Um, that's something we both struggled with. Me and Christine, we were best friends. We did the outlandish stuff got in trouble. We weren't the, the teenage girls of getting your nails done and going to the mall. That was not us. Christine was so full of life. Uh, she was a goofball. We got in trouble with drinking, partying. We were the cool ones in school. In high school, Christine started dating Jimbo. They really hit it off. Christine was 19 and she got pregnant with Haley. And when Haley was born, Christine bloomed, she blossomed, she became a grown-up. But Jimbo had cancer and ultimately he passed. Christine was really devastated after she lost Jimbo. Me and Stephen, we had gotten married. We decided we were going to stop drinking. We offered to adopt Haley because Christine didn't have the means to look after her. Christine was lost for a while. Then she met this guy named Levi. I didn't know him too well, but she said Levi was nice to her in the beginning. Levi swooned her. He treated her like a queen. With him, she had two boys. You know, now she's got three kids. But Levi wasn't a family man. He loved those boys, but he didn't provide for them. Steve and I bought the boys formula, diapers, food, because he wouldn't do it. He was into drugs. So Christine was living with Lynn, along with Haley and the two boys. It was close quarters, but we were doing pretty good. Steve and I were working. We had our own business. Christine would help with the office work. But when you have two women, like-minded women, in the same house, you tend to butt heads. Milk was like $3 and something a gallon. And the little one would drink like a gallon a day, okay? So I just asked her, I said, can you please, like, maybe not give him so much milk, you know, give him something else to drink? Well, that went into a full-fledged fight, you know, and um, uh, she pushed me, I pushed her. I said some things, and she said some things. And then she called her friend and said, you know, I need to get a ride. I'm not staying here anymore. Christine had some friends in Pocomoke, Maryland. That was Tia and Junior. Tia and Junior were a couple, but Tia had two children. Christine and Tia hit it off pretty good, you know, because they had a lot in common. Christine and Tia did bond because they were single moms. They both had a rough life. Tia told her that she can come down and take the boys and come stay as long as she wants. Christine only took a couple of backpacks with the kids clothes for like a weekend or whatever, clear her head. And a couple weeks later, I got a phone call saying that Christine was gone, but the boys were there, like by themselves. 
And nothing was adding up to me because I knew she would never leave without her kids. And that's when I filed my missing person report. In 2007, I was a detective with the Worcester County Sheriff's Office. Christine was last seen at a farm in Pocomoke, Maryland, which is the southern end of Worcester County, where she was staying with some friends. A uniformed deputy was dispatched to the farm to take an initial missing person report. The farm was in a very remote, rural area of the county. Upon the deputy's arrival, he was met by the uh, residents of the farmhouse, and they told the deputy Christine and her children had been staying with them for several weeks, and that on the day of Christine's disappearance, they had left the property to go shopping, and when they returned, Christine was gone, and they had found Christine's young children alone at the house. We're just right over the Maryland border into Delaware. This is where Christine grew up. It is where her mother, Lynn, now lives on her horse farm. I feel deeply for Lynn. I don't know what I would do if my child were missing. I'm gonna go visit her and learn more about her daughter and about how this case unfolded. We're going to hug. Look at this place. Would you like to see that? Yeah, I would love that. Okay, let me get a coat. Yeah, watch out. There's water. Yeah. It's nothing special oh, stop. in here. This is great. This is Puzzle. That's Mia. Hey, Mama. And then there's Donald. Hi. You spend a lot of time out here? I do. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it keeps you sane. You can talk to them and they don't roll their eyes. And there's no judgment, is there, baby? They know when you're hurting. And they just let me know it's okay. They have been and always will be part of my healing process. It's an ongoing thing. Christine? She's a beautiful girl. Oh my God, she's stunning. Yeah. Wish I could have done better by her. I want a good mom. Yeah, it's hard. And you had kids really young, right? Mm -hmm. I got pregnant when I was 16 with my first. Well, you were still a kid at that point. Yeah, I was. I was. A kid with a kid. Right. Yeah. After you get the phone call that Christine is missing, investigators go out and check out the farm. They walked around. They couldn't see anything of Christine. The police did interview Tia and Junior. Tia and Junior told the deputy that she had uh, departed the farm and they had no idea where she was. Uh, as they were looking around, they found an empty vodka bottle. They found a jar of change that was missing and they found a note left by Christine saying that she was leaving. So this is the letter that Christine left. I want to thank you, too, for allowing my children and I to come stay with you and your family. The note was left. Money's gone. Alcohol is gone. So there were things that looked like she left under her own free will. Yes. We learned that neighbors to this farm had trail cameras set up. The cameras were able to show Tia and Junior leaving the property and then coming back. The camera footage did not show anyone else coming or going, be it another vehicle or Christine. So they had a timeline of when the cars were coming and going. And did that back up Junior and Tia's story? Yes. Even though the farm is in an isolated area, it's only a few miles to an interstate. The camera was focused on a driveway, so it was entirely possible that Christine had walked around the camera out onto the road. She could have gone anywhere. When Christine went missing, my first suspicion was Levi was involved with my daughter Christine's disappearance. If you stepped out of line of what Levi wanted, 
or Levi thought was okay, then it was holy hell. Christine would deal with the screaming matches, the fighting. With Levi, it was tumultuous all, all the time. And uh, the last time she came home, she had black eyes. Levi had told Christine if she ever left with the kids, he would kill her. There were criminal charges filed against Levi that I saw Mm -hmm. in police records. I had him in court three or four times, I think. Levi was definitely a suspect in her disappearance. So Levi was questioned. He said he was at work during the time of Christine's disappearance. And he provided the detective with information that uh, kind of uh, opened the door to other possibilities that Christine may have just voluntarily walked off. He had retrieved, along with her two children, certain personal items of Christine's from the farm. There was a uh, spiral-bound notebook that Christine had been using as a personal journal. Within the journal, there was poetry, notes, random thoughts. Uh, There was also a page of listing different support agencies, as well as numbers for adoption agencies. That certainly is a little peculiar. We submitted a journal entry by Christine Shetty, as well as the letter that she had left at the farmhouse to a a statement examiner, and uh, he produced the following report. The writing is self-absorbed, and Miss Shetty's poetry indicates that she's frustrated with her life. The word embrace is a term of welcome and desire. I think this is about losing the life she has presently and a desire for the unknown or something new. That would support the idea that she left voluntarily. So police form their opinion about Christine's state of mind based on these journals. Did investigators ever come up and do an interview with you to learn more about your daughter? No. Nothing? Nothing. Mm -mm. I was always calling. If I heard anything, I would call and relay it to the detectives. And they would get back with me. Yeah. Okay, but then it was kind of a little lull, and I was wondering, you know, hey, I need somebody to, you know, call me. So I called down, and I got the supervisor, Mike McDermott, mm-hmm. and I said, well, you know, I would like to be kept in the loop a little more. And, and he said, let me explain something to you. Your daughter was a sponge on society because of her lack of work history, and she simply disappeared on a drunken drug binge. Oh, oh God. How do you say that to someone who has a missing child? I just couldn't believe what I had heard. And then a couple of days after I spoke with Mike, I got this. District Court of Maryland for Worcester County, arrest warrant for desertion of a minor child against Christine Marie Shetty. It's kind of a slap in the face. This here just made me fight harder. I became interested in the case shortly after it began through discussion with other detectives. We all knew each other, small town, uh, local police departments. We all talked. But at that point in time, it wasn't my responsibility to investigate it. The supervisor of the case, Mike McDermott, he was convinced that Christine had just ran off um, and left her children. You know, there were detectives under him that were good detectives. But when your supervisor's controlling um, the resources that you have and the direction that you're going, basically forced these detectives to go down the path to prove his theory correct. Is there any forward momentum? Is anybody making any strides in the case? I called local TV stations. I asked them if they could put my daughter's picture on TV. Christine Shetty was last seen on November 3rd. We made up flyers and we distributed to Maryland and back. It would be very fair to say uh, in this area that the rumor mill is a central part of uh, how information is transferred between people. There were literally hundreds of tips that were called or emailed into us. We had store clerks calling in, bus drivers, distant associates, people that had gone to high school with her. 
there were some tips and stuff coming in. Nothing came of it, but I did my own investigation. I met Tia and Junior's neighbor. She's a very sweet woman. She said, Lynn, you do realize there's another guy living in that house. Wait, what? Yes, there was another guy living in the house. I know. Were police aware of him? Not until I told them. They had no idea. No. The neighbor told me Justin was Tia's cousin. When the police came, uh -huh. he would disappear. He would hide or whatever, he, you know. And Tia and Junior never said anything about him. So it looks like Tia and Junior have been covering for this kid. Well, nobody said, you know, Justin's here. Hey, you want to talk to Justin? Nobody said that. Mm -hmm. When I found out, I called Detective Kagan and I told him, I said, there's another guy living there. He goes, no, there's not. And I said, yes, you need to go out there. No one had mentioned that this person had even existed. By the time we learned that Justin had indeed been staying at the residence, he had left the state and moved to Texas with his father. That immediately raised red flags. We went back to the farm. There were multiple searches done. We used cadaver dogs. We did grid searches. We were looking for any signs of Christine, signs of unusual activity on the property. One day, I called down and they said, oh, they're out at the property doing a search. So I brought a toothbrush and a hairbrush with, you know, Christine's DNA for a DNA sample. So I went down there and they had the Maryland State helicopter out there and cadaver dogs. So I walked up with the toothbrush and hairbrush and I handed it off to the police. Okay. And I remember hearing one dog bark, but then nothing, you know, came of it. Detective Kagan was active, but the supervisor, Mike McDermott, he didn't want this investigation. I think it was easier for him to say, I did everything that I could. We did searches, we did this, we did that, and I had a warrant issued for her arrest. And as a result of that, interest starts to, 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 to move on. The case starts to grow cold. I was sitting here going, okay. What can I do? Yeah. And then a friend of mine called me up and he said, Lynn, there's a blog called the Pokemoke Tattler. You need to get hold of Stephanie. I didn't know what a blog was, but I got in contact with Stephanie Burke. Lynn reached out. She sounded really nice and articulate and a very concerned mom. And she told me all of this that had happened to her daughter. I said, yes. I said, you know, we're a local blog and we talk about things that happen with and around Pocomoke City. Absolutely. I'm going to put this on the front page. Come to find out, her and her husband were friends with Mike McDermott and his wife. Oh, interesting. Yes. The supervisor. I knew Mike McDermott personally uh, from church. And I called him and asked him what the deal was. And... His first response to me was, Stephanie, you would never associate with those people. And I was flabbergasted. And I said, why would you say that? And he said, they're bad news. <laughs> it was just unbelievable to me that I could know, but, know somebody that could be so callous to express these things about this family that he had no clue about. So I told Lynn, you let me know anything you find out, and I'm going to publish it for you. And in a small area like that, I got the word out really quickly. And as soon as we'd, we'd post something, there would be replies. We were just alerting the community. If somebody does something, usually somebody knows something. We started digging. So I guess that makes me an internet sleuth, but I didn't know that then. <laughs> I was reaching out to everybody. At the time, it was my space. I pretty much taught myself how to do it. It's just you have to network. It was pretty simple. You hear a name, say Tia Johnson, and I'd go to her page. And you check out their friends, and then you hit their friends up, and they would tell me stuff. It was incredible. People started pointing fingers at Tia and Junior very quickly. They had been in a lot of trouble. 
there was none of that running away stuff that Tia and Junior and them were talking about. It was a lot of dark stuff on there. What was that feeling the first time someone wrote you back? It was great. I was getting information. Yeah. You know, and as I got information, I would send it to the police. Do you feel like the more active you got, were they receptive to it, or did they start to shut down on you? They didn't like me doing their job, but I wasn't going to stop. As time went on, I was just racking my brain, trying to figure out where she was and what had happened. The farm is on 68 acres, and it's just woodland. Some places were wet, you know, and, and dense. I had to have been out there, God, countless amounts of time, just searching on my own. Snowing, raining, hot. You're going past these woods, and you look in the woods thinking, could she be there? I couldn't imagine standing up to these forces that she was up against. She just kept moving. Lesser women would have given up a long time ago. When Christine went missing, we lost the house, the business, everything, because I couldn't help my husband. He said, Lynn, I need your help, you know, because he was falling behind. I said, I can't help you. And I could not help him because I knew I had to find my daughter. That's hard. How did you find the strength to keep going? Well, Christine had an older brother. That was Michael. He was just a sweet, sweet boy. One day, when he graduated school, he went to a party, and all of a sudden, a big fight spilled out of the house. And he come around, you know, the building, and somebody pointed at him, and he said, that's the guy that hit Dawn. He wasn't even in there. So they piled on him and beat him to death. I'm so sorry, Lynn. Eventually, the police had four arrested. There were six altogether, but they didn't have enough evidence to prosecute the other two. And the prosecuting attorney, he said, we got four. What more do you want? And I remember not saying a word. And it ate at me for years. So when Christine went missing, I promised I would not, not say anything anymore. There were skeletal remains of a petite woman that was found in Westminster. So I called my cops yeah. and told them about it because I had given them the toothbrush and stuff. So the DNA should have been on file. But something told me to go one step further. So what I did is I got the number of the officer in charge of that case and I called her. I told her who I was. She said, I don't want to point any fingers at another police agency that there is no DNA for your daughter on file. They never turned it in. It wasn't Christine, but it's just such a betrayal of trust. During the time, it just didn't seem that anything was happening. With the Tadler blog, we covered the story for a little over two years that I called Lynn and told her that she needed to speak to, with Sean Sarver. He had helped me with a special investigation over election fraud. And I saw in him an honesty and integrity that I hadn't seen with the local law enforcement that I had talked to and thought if anybody could help with Lynn's case, he could. We're heading into town here to meet with Sean Sarver, who was an investigator for the state's attorney. He heard Lynn's story and got involved. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing his take on this investigation from law enforcement's perspective. Sean, hi. Oh, hi, how are you, Hillary? It's so nice, nice to meet, to meet you. you. Was there any time that you took to decide whether you were going to get involved, or it was pretty quick? Oh, it was quick. When Lynn discovered um, that DNA had not been entered for her daughter's case. So they absolutely lied to her? Absolutely lied. <sighs> they claimed they lost it. So as part of your special investigator powers, you, you can 
take over an investigation from a police department um, if you believe that there's malfeasance or anything going on in the case. So that's what I did. I went up to the Worcester County Bureau of Investigation and grabbed the file and took it to the office and home and started looking through it. What are the first things that pop out to you? There was some tips mm -hmm. that were called in that weren't followed up on. Really? But there were gaps in it and pieces of information that could have been followed up on that weren't. And most of it was supplied by Lynn. What was the reaction to Lynn? I think that they had developed a, um, a dislike, you know, for Lynn because she was hounding them mm -hmm. and forcing them to work. And, you know, they would ignore her calls. What was the working theory at the time? The working theory at the time um, was basically that Christine probably just ran away. Once you were able to pour through all of those files, what did your gut tell you had happened? She was murdered. I was online, and something came in. I had somebody get in touch with me and say, Lynn, you've got to get on this one. It's called Tennessee Topics. It's a blog in Tennessee. She said, there's somebody down there talking about Junior. I'm looking at this thread, and this one girl saying, well, I know Junior, you know, you know, he's a really nice guy. Her name was Kim. I got on there, I told her who I was. I said, I just want you to be really careful. And I gave her my number. And one day, I'm going down the road, I get a phone call from Kim. I pull over, and she says, I just want to let you know that I have a letter from Junior telling her to get in touch with me. Junior was in Tennessee and was arrested for arson. He was looking at a lot of time. So the only bargaining chip he could find was through Kim to get in touch with me. He said if I get him out of Tennessee and back to Maryland, he would give me what I've been looking for for over two years. Once you're in charge of the investigation, what kind of information was Lynn bringing you? She was networking. Um, a lot on social media and she was keeping herself in touch with key players. The big break in the case comes when Lynn receives a letter from Junior. So what does this letter say? Write me back ASAP on this one, okay? With a question mark, please, exclamation. He said, tell her I said to get me out of here and bring to Maryland and I will give her what she wants in all caps, I didn't do it. I mean, this is a just a bomb. This is just a detective's dream. Yeah. Um, and of course, you get information like that and you have to act really fast. I flew out to Tennessee with some other detectives and the state's attorney to speak with Junior and to find out what exactly he knew about Christine. My name is Mike Farlow. I'm an assistant state's attorney in Worcester County, Maryland, here in Snow Hill. When the investigators get into the jail cell, one of the first things that Junior says is, look, I didn't kill Christine, but I know where she's buried and I know who did it. The state's attorney, Joel Todd, and Junior's lawyer enter into an agreement where if Junior gave information to the state regarding the location of Christine, what had actually happened, agree to testify, and most importantly, pass a polygraph test to be able to verify the information, then he wouldn't be prosecuted for any of the murder charges. I remember the state's attorney called me. He said he's willing to tell us where Christine is. Do you know how awesome that was? At that point in time, with the agreement negotiated, Junior goes ahead and he starts telling the story. Junior tells the investigators that Justin and Christine had had a brief relationship uh, while the two of them had been living there. This day, he and Justin and Christine all had a party behind the house. They had started drinking, that uh, they had started wrestling around some, uh, and then there was an argument that had occurred that Justin had pushed her to the ground, and Christine got very upset, according to Junior, and she ran off into the woods. 
Junior says he followed Christine, and as he described it, they began having consensual sex uh, in the woods. Junior went on to tell us that uh, while this was occurring, uh, Justin walked up, saw what was going on, and began yelling at Christine. Junior said that he didn't want to get involved in a uh, domestic disturbance between the two, and he started walking away. Uh, He said that he saw that Justin was holding a shovel. When he left the area and went back up to the house, he describes hearing multiple thuds, almost like a bat hitting a softball. A few minutes later, he went back into the woods. He discovered that Christine was dead, beaten to death, and Justin was standing near the body. Junior went on to tell us that Tia ended up arriving back at the farm soon thereafter, and later that evening when it got dark, he and Justin took Tia's car and they brought Christine's body and they put her into the back of the trunk. And they ended up looting Tia's children into the car. Tia, Junior, and Justin, with Christine in the trunk, drove to Snow Hill. They decide that they're going to drive her to a place called the River House Inn that Junior and Tia both used to work at because they knew that it was closed for construction. They knew that there wouldn't be anybody around. And according to Junior, Tia and the kids go right to sleep after they break into a guest cottage. And that's when he and Justin go down to bury the body right next to the guest cottage. Junior is going to end up going free for this, but he's going to help us get the guy that we believe did it, who is Justin Hadel. But then his story starts changing a little bit. Uh, It's no longer just that he had consensual sex with Christine. All of a sudden, he's telling investigators that when Justin sees them, uh, that they start having a threesome. Once they take Junior's statement after this interview, as an investigator, when you hear these details that are offered up, what does that look like to you? I'm asking if you believe them. Because the deal Junior signed was that if he lies about anything... Correct. He can be sent back to Tennessee, or he could be tried for other crimes here. Correct. Do you think it was consensual sex? I don't. I I don't know. I mean, for me, (laughs) it feels like they raped her. You know, this whole story of play fighting and sleeping with both of them... Right. Yeah. ...is far-fetched to me. Yeah. I I mean, and again, it's... it's, uh, it's covering his, covering her tracks. I come up with some sort of an excuse that if she's found, if the DNA is located there, then, you know, this explains it. Yeah. <sighs> Ultimately, um, he convinced investigators that he had accurate information uh-huh. um, of where her body would be found, um, and then uh, he drew them a map. He drew you a map? Yes. Yep. Do you recognize this place? Yes. Yeah, it's uh, the River House Inn, actually located in Snow Hill. They walked around comparing the map that Junior had drawn with the River House Inn property and got ready to start digging and excavating to see if Junior is telling the truth. This is the River House Inn, bed and breakfast the location that was depicted on the map that Junior drew. And interesting side note, the red building over here is the courthouse, uh, which housed my office and the state's attorney's office at the time. And the sheriff's department is actually in the rear of that building. So we had direct view. Go throw a rock. Go throw a rock. That's insane. Junior says, this is where I've put Christine. It's at the rear of the property. Take a walk behind the main building, the last house on the left. This is where he identified where the body would be located. And he puts an X there, right here, is is where we start digging. Once we were able to locate the area, we believed uh, Christine's body was, was buried. We had forensic investigators that came in and started a excavation. So I said, well, I want to be down there. We asked Lynn to stay in a hotel nearby, uh, and she had a direct phone line to the state's attorney, myself, and, and other detectives. Forensic digs are very slow, very tedious. You're scraping off inches of layers of soil and running them through a, through a sieve. 
So as investigators are digging, digging, and the sun is starting to set, and it's already a cold day, but it's getting colder, and everybody is wondering, are we going to find her or not? And I think there was a point there where everybody was starting to wonder if we had been lied to. But the dig team uh, continued to dig, and then we heard somebody say they got something. And uh, when we came over, I could see a tennis shoe down at the bottom, uh, and you could tell that there was obviously human remains um, still inside the shoe. I I couldn't even tell you how many times I've driven past this. You know, she was here all along. It feels so arrogant. Right. And audacious. I can still see the courthouse from here. Yep. And what's really frustrating is that no one would have ever figured it out if it hadn't been for Lynn. I remember they all came in. They said, we found her shoe. Said they knew that they had her. Two years, three months, and seven days of fighting came to an end that day. I just wanted my daughter back, and I got her back. I believe Christine would have gone on to do great things. There's not a day that goes by I don't think about her. Christine was one that always helped others, even though she didn't have it herself. She could make a bad day, turn around quick. Finally, Lynn gets some finality. And the state's attorney's office was able to be Lynn's voice in front of a jury. Justin ended up pleading guilty to first-degree murder, got a life sentence, but all but 30 years suspended. Junior had given information where Christine was located, but Junior failed the polygraph test. At that point, it was clear that he was involved in the murder itself. He ended up pleading guilty also to first-degree murder and got life but 30 years suspended. Tia's initial story was that she didn't know that Christine was in the car. She didn't know she was dead. But ultimately, Tia was sentenced to five years uh, on accessory after the fact and 10 years on burglary. The only reason that she only got five years on the accessory after the fact is because that was the maximum allowed by law at the time. Tia got more time for the breaking and entering than the accessory after the fact. It made me feel something had to change. Just like Lynn fought to get Christine's killers convicted, she fought tooth and nail to get the legislature to change that law to increase the maximum penalty. I was really, really proud when I stood in line and got behind the governor of Maryland as he signed the Shetty Bennett Act. My daughter's name lives on. We can all learn some lessons from Lynn about tenacity and about just never giving up. You know, if Lynn Dodenhoff came from a well-to-do family, you know, if she lived in one of these mansions in town, I don't think she would have been dismissed as easily. What is remarkable about Lynn is that even when she was proven correct, she didn't try to burn anyone down. She got active, and she started getting laws passed so that no other families would have to deal with the same set of circumstances that she dealt with. And that ripple effect really matters. Lynn Dodenhoff has been able to protect other people from the same fate that she and Christine experienced.